Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Welcome back. I am embarrassed to say that I nearly let our next guest slip us by. I am sure that other people miss books they get published too. There are so many about the Gilded Age and Progressive Era that I have not read and I haven't featured on the show, which is partially a matter of what crosses my desk and what my searches turn up. But for whatever reason, I missed Dr. Megan Threkeld's excellent monograph, Citizens of the World, U.S. Women and Global Governance. But today, I'm writing that wrong, because today, Megan joins me to discuss citizenship, women's activism in the period, and the peace movement, all of which are key to understanding the period. Citizenship, of course, was a major feature, whether we're talking about the post-Reconstruction struggle against Jim Crow laws, the suffrage movement for women, or the ongoing fight for recognition in American territories like Puerto Rico. I mean, Professor Heather Cox Richardson has even said that citizenship is the defining issue of the Gilded Age. So we'll dive into that, but on a global level, and ask, are we citizens of the world? Now, naturally, that has implications for politics and social justice, then as it does now. But in addition, Megan's book explores the identity of women and the place of women in society by way of global citizenship. We'll hear today about several activists who transformed the landscape of international relations, but may have slipped past our radar, in part because they are women and they had less access or freedoms as men in the diplomatic arena. And finally, Peace is a big feature of Megan's book, and this is actually something that we have not talked about extensively on the show, so it's great to feature it here. Arbitration came in the age of the Gilded, well, the Gilded Age in the early 20th century, as did the League of Nations, which was devised to end aggression between states. The peace movement has much to do with both, and it's an interesting way to understand the various bedfellows that got into cahoots in order to govern the world, so to speak. Dr. Megan Threckhold is the Michael G. and Barbara W. Rao Professor of History at Denison University in Ohio. In 2014, she published her first book, another exceptional title, on international history called Pan-American Women, U.S. Internationalists in Revolutionary Mexico. She's also written several fantastic articles for leading journals and is moving into the second half of the 20th century with her latest research project called Selective Justice, The Draft, The Law, and The Vietnam War. I met Megan at the Society for Historians of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era annual meeting at the Organization of American Historians early this year in April. When she told me about her latest book, I knew we had to talk more, and I'm so pleased she agreed to come on the show. Welcome, Megan. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. Um, And the book is uh, all about citizenship. It's all about women. It's all about international diplomacy and law. So... Those are all really complex things. Not not women, but you know, I mean, citizenship and international law. I think it might be good for people that are listening if we start off with some basics and we do a little bit of groundwork in the beginning. Can you define for me global citizenship? Because it seems like it should be an easy term, but you actually take a three-part approach to the idea of global citizenship. And I'm wondering if you could fill us in on what those three parts are. Yeah, of course. So yeah, global citizenship is one of those terms where we think, okay, I know what global means, and I think I know what citizenship means, and you put them together, and all of a sudden, you have no idea what we're talking about. (laughs) It is, it's a, you know, the idea of global citizenship is a, it's one I think that people use a lot, but they can mean a lot of different things by it. And one of the reasons that I wrote this book is because I was interested in what these women in particular meant when they used they used the term world citizenship, which I think of as the equivalent of global citizenship. I wanted to know, was this just a pretty phrase that they happened to be using the way that I think we hear a lot of people use it now, or did they really mean something by it? And I don't think it's an easy term to define. I certainly don't think it's a term that we can define universally for all people in all places at all times. So what I tried to do in the book was just be clear about my definition, and that was a definition that I really drew from what I saw these women doing. So yes, in the book, I advance a three-part definition of world citizenship. 
The first is that the term represents a determination to participate in shaping the global polity. So I argue that these women use the term world citizenship because they were demanding to participate in shaping some kind of world government. They didn't agree on what that government should look like. They didn't agree on who all should be involved, but they were all demanding to participate in shaping. So that's the first aspect. Then my second component of world citizenship is an obligation to work for peace. So we know from lots of other historians and scholars of citizenship that it includes responsibilities as well as rights. And I think that that is true of global citizenship as well. I think that all of these women were making the argument that they felt, and they felt that others had, a responsibility to ensure that that World War I and World War II would not happen again, to later on to ensure that, for example, atomic weapons would be brought under control in whatever way peace was going to manifest itself. And again, they all saw that in different ways. They believed they had a responsibility to help bring it about. And then the third component is about equality. And this one is probably the trickiest because in the abstract, citizenship is an equalizing word. Citizens are not subjects. They are in principle all equal to one another. But again, we know that in practice, this is not the case. So my argument is that these women use the term global citizenship as an argument for equality, but at the same time, I recognize that that was more often a theoretical desire for equality than a practical one. So all but one of these women were white. Some of them were what I would call imperialist and civilizationist and believed in white superiority. But they, when they used the term citizen, that carried with it equalizing potential whether or not these women themselves actually realize. Okay, so let me tell you why I love that de definition so much. Because although your book looks at these nine women, it actually, that definition applies to everyone that was thinking about global citizenship in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. So, you know, I'll be writing something about Theodore Roosevelt and global citizenship, and he would have believed in the same ideas, even peace, although his version of peace, right? And, and even equality, his version of equality. But they were, I mean, this is what makes your book so brilliant is that definition has such a broad application over the entire period. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I wanted to signal that out for like one of the most important things that I think your book does is kind of define global citizenship in that way. The other thing that I really wanted to pick apart was the uh, the reason why women are so important in the story of global citizenship. And I've read the book, so I know the answer to that. But I'm wondering if you could say it for listeners. What makes women so important in this this move for global citizenship? I think I think there are a couple of things. One is that these women represented an important critique of the status quo. So obviously in the first half of the 20th century, there were a lot of people trying to decide what should the world look like. There were study groups and there was the League of Nations and there was the United Nations and there was the things like the Commission to Study the Organization of Peace. And you know, I mean, in, in a lot of particularly Western countries, in the United States in particular, there were a ton of organizations that were trying to decide what a world policy should look like. And there were very few women involved in that in those endeavors, particularly before the 1940s. So these women in this book who are making these arguments about world citizenship and making that demand to participate in the shaping of the global polity, they represent an important critique to the status quo of uh, the Hague Conferences on International Arbitration and the original formation of the League of Nations, and then the, even the debates in the United States over whether to join the League in the 1920s. When you pay attention to these women, they start to point out the limitations, not, not only the ones that we already know about, but the limitations of how representative those organizations were and could be, the limitations of how many people around the world could actually participate 
in things like the League of Nations. So I think I think that that's the first thing is that these these women's voices were an important critique. And then the other thing that I think is really important for looking at women is that they understand citizenship in ways that men don't. A lot of these women were or would have been suffragists. They knew very well (laughs) what the gendered limitations of citizenship were. And they brought that understanding, particularly when it came to gender, again, less so when it came to race, but they brought that understanding of the gendered conception of citizenship to their arguments for global citizenship. So they they understood that just to say that, oh, yes, all the people of the world are global citizens didn't automatically mean that oh, of course, everyone in the world is equal because they understood very well that even after 1920, when white women in the United States got the right to vote, that they were still not full equal citizens of the United States. Yeah, so that idea of citizenship as belonging and women having a really uh, uh, an inside track on what belonging means in the early 20th century. Uh, I want to I want to talk more about the uniqueness of women in global citizenship. But before we do, I wanted to give you an opportunity to say, why you picked these nine women, because that was a decision. That's part of your methodology. And I think you should probably tell people about why they either are representative or why they're important. It, it it was a long process to get to these nine women. And, you know, at one point I had a list, I'm sure I still have it somewhere, of probably 40 or 50 women <laughs> that could have been on this list. I bet you the publisher didn't like the idea of 40 women being featured in the book. I remember actually in the original proposal for the book, I think there were five. And then, you know, as I wrote, I came across more women, you know, there was one woman who fell off the original list because I didn't, I realized I didn't have enough material on her. The amount of archival material was one of the factors that went into choosing these women. I, you know, if it was a woman who didn't publish very much and who, for whatever reason, didn't really show up in organizational archives, then, you know, there's there, there wasn't much I could do with that. So there were other women that I would have liked to talk about, but I just didn't have enough material. And then there were a couple of other women who made their way onto the list because I realized that I was missing an important angle on world citizenship, for example. Um, but really, as I put together the list of nine, I wanted... I wanted a well-rounded list, a a diverse intellectual list is what I wanted. I wanted women who thought about world citizenship in different ways, who thought about world government in different ways, who thought about peace in different ways. And that was what I really ended up looking for. So for example, um, one of the women who was not originally on the list, who I decided eventually I just had to include was Esther Brunauer. And Part of the reason that I didn't include her initially is because she she doesn't talk that much about citizenship. She's one of, I think, a couple of women in the book who actually rarely used the term world citizenship. But the way in which she talked about the role of the United States in the world, particularly in the 1930s, Esther Brunau is really interesting because she is in Germany for a year in 1933. She goes on a fellowship for the American Association of University Women. And so she sees firsthand what's happening in Germany. And she comes back to the United States and tries to convince people in the United States that that this is serious and that Hitler is serious and that the United States needs needs to do more to oppose him and to oppose German expansion much earlier. And of course, very few people listen to her. And so her conception of the role the United States should play in the world was based very much on collective security. It was based on the idea that the United States had an obligation to ensure peace in the long term by confronting Nazism in the short term. So her take, I I just decided eventually I had to include her because her take on on world citizenship and on the role the United States should play in the world, I thought was a really, really important one in the context of the 1930s. 
So, you know, it was, it was a long process of coming to these nine women, but in the end, I'm really happy with how the list turned out because I think they really do represent a wide variety of thought. Oh, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's a real diversity of uh, intellect there. The archival material makes a lot of sense too. And I was actually really uh, happy to see your first chapter, which deals with Lucia Ames Mead. I, I've actually been to Swarthmore to, to, to look through her and her husband's uh, archival records there, of which there are tons. And she's a fascinating character. Uh, her view was that nationalism would wane as global citizenship became more prevalent. And, uh, and she was a pacifist as well. Uh, she w- she was in the Lake Mohonk Conference uh, and, and other similar forums. Um, she believed that to be a global citizen, one had to be a patriotic nationalist. Yeah, I mean, how? I mean, that seems like a contradiction in some ways too to some of the other women that are are featured here. But how does that debate shape other discussions about the international order? Is it a nationalist first or a internationalist first? Which comes first? I think for a lot of people in the United States before and even during World War I, it's you have to be a nationalist first (laughs) because the United States is still so reluctant to get politically involved in any kind of world commitment. And so anyone who is not making the case that you have to be a strong United States citizen first and a world citizen second, I don't think is gonna get much of a hearing at all. So even for somebody like Lucia Ames Mead, it was it was mostly about arbitration. It was about, you know, the Lake Mohawk conferences started out about arbitration. And she was one of the people who was really promoting the Hague conferences in 1899 and 1907. And so for her, she recognized that if there was any chance to get the United States to join any kind of even limited binding agreement on arbitration of international disputes, that she would have, she she knew her audience, she knew she would have to make clear that, yes, I am a patriot, yes, I am a United States citizen, yes, the United States is fantastic, (laughs) And, and because it is, because we are a world leader, it's our responsibility to start to, to set an example for the world community by joining some of these arrangements. So I think it was strategic, for Mead, I think she was pretty savvy about, about knowing what she would need to do to appeal to any significant number of Americans. Well, that's interesting that it, it was a, a strategic. I mean, she does say that that would wane, that nationalism was wane, would wane. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And she also shows a little bit of that or a lot of that hypocrisy that you mentioned earlier on in the sense that she believes that some people are unsuited to global citizenship and that they're uncivilized. And, and I, I suppose I wanted to hear about how that logic works, that we're all part of humanity, but actually only some of us can join the club. And for a suffragist, suffragist that seems particularly problematic. On the surface, it does. And yet it really wasn't. I mean, I think I think actually Fanny Fern Andrews is an even better example of this because she too was a suffragist and she was even, I would argue, more civil civilizationist in her outlook than Mead. For, for somebody like Fanny Fern Andrews, she was very much a progressive in the sense that she believed in progress. She believed that human beings and societies progressed along you know, these very sort of Whiggish lines. And she believed that the United States and that white Americans were further along the civilizational path than certainly than Cubans or Filipinos, certainly than lots of people in other parts of the world. And she definitely had some of the kind of benevolent imperialist attitude that was very common in the United States around the time of the War of 1898. But she also you know, what what came along with that was a clear belief that not all people in the world were ready (laughs) to participate in the global polity. And so for Andrews, it was very much about education. She believed that she and others like her had a responsibility to educate, in her case, to educate children in the United States, but in a larger sense to help educate people around the world for participation in democracy. And that I actually think was pretty common among white suffragists in the early 20th century. And so actually in that regard, unfortunately, she was not all that unusual. 
Yes, that is, uh, it's unfortunate, of course. Yeah, I, you you raise education, so I want to go there. The other unfortunate, I suppose, uh, view or perspective at the time was that women were great at educating, that, you know, they made natural educators because they were good with children. And you mentioned that Andrews, obviously, she she wrote curriculums about, you know, patriotism and inter- internationalism. Can you just tell me a little bit about how that worked in theory? Well, you've explained the theory, but how did that work in practice? You know, were were her were her texts, were her curriculum, were they were they widely adopted or was there a lot of resistance to them? So what I know is that they sold very well. So I know that her curriculum, especially the course on um, patriotism, sold very well. And I actually, I can't find it at the moment, but somewhere in the book, I, I found at one point some numbers from Houghton Mifflin, the publisher, about how well that sold. I know that there were um, there were meetings, for example, at, at the annual meeting of the National Education Association that were about peace curricula. And so it, it, she wasn't the only one who was writing these things. Um, but I think the American School of Peace League, and then later it was called the American School of Citizenship League, was one of the most prominent national organizations involved in this kind of work. And so whether or not it was Andrew's curriculum specifically, or if it was something similar, my sense is that they were they were actually very widely used in the 19-teens. I don't know of any particular reactions against them. I do know that at, in, immediately after World War I, so 1918, 1919, when the first Red Scare hit the United States, that there was resistance to the idea that Andrews was teaching children about peace and pacifism and that potentially signified danger for a lot of people in 1919. And so that was actually why she changed the name of her organization from the Peace League to the Citizenship League. She did that very consciously because she knew that the idea of peace was suspect in 1919. And so that I think was probably the the best example of pushback um, on her curriculum specifically that I found. But I don't think I don't think it was terribly controversial, again, because, you know, she was promoting these ideas of civilization and white superiority that uh, that a lot of white Americans would have agreed with at this time. Yeah, that's really well contextualized. I, I think there's an Andrews in Chicago in the 1920s that uh, rails against pro-British textbooks of which, you know, this would have kind of fallen in that vein. But um, a- sure. Andrews here, uh, Fanny Andrews, that is. Um, she also believed in an American-led League of Nations. And obviously yes. the League is such a central debate to the sort of crowning achievement of the progressive era in many ways. But she also thought that it could enable or foster gender equality. And I was wondering if you could tell us about how she thought the League, and particularly the American-led aspect of the League, could foster that sort of equality. For her, it was about women being qualified to participate in the League. So Fanny Fern Andrews was very highly educated. She had attended Radcliffe College, and then she later in the early 1920s got a PhD in international relations at Harvard. And she was one of these progressive era women who really was a specialist in her field. For her, it was education and international relations, but there were you know, women in, um, in Chicago who were social workers. There were a lot of professional women in this generation who were qualified to do things like serve on an international council of education, which was one of the things that Andrews wanted. And she wanted a council like that to be part of the League of Nations. So for her, it was very much about about a small group of women, about these women who had political expertise, but she thought that they could absolutely participate on an equal basis in some kind of permanent world organization because they had all this expertise they could bring to the table. Interesting. Yeah, that's um, just by being there, I guess. Um, all right. We One of the things that I spoke of earlier that I wanted to come back to is this idea of a maternal spirit. Uh, I had a former PhD student, a brilliant 
guy, John Coburn, who's now at the University of Lincoln, who wrote about Women's Strike for Peace. And I know you're studying Vietnam at the moment now, so you'll know who this group is. But if anyone doesn't, they they railed against uh, nuclear pr proliferation and they were anti-war activists. Uh, John Coburn wrote a piece recently about how it was led by upper class or upper middle class mothers who felt this maternal spirit that it gave them, as you were saying earlier, a unique insight into humanity. And I was wondering if your nine activists, if they had that, that same sense. I know that some of them see the family as this base unit in a global community, but do mothers have a unique place in the family, or at least do these nine women think that mothers have a unique place in, in a global space? Interestingly, most of them would probably have said no. <laughs> Um, a sign of the I times, think, I guess, is it? Well, I don't know. I actually think it's unusual for the time in the sense that the maternalist arguments for peace were, were pretty strong. But I think, I think I have this right. I think it's Lucia Ames Mead who actually says women aren't any more naturally pacifist than men. And she's saying that in the, in the context of making an argument about how children need peace education because they're not, whether they're boys or girls, they're not naturally pacifist. However, there was one of these nine women who I am certain would have disagreed and who would have said, yes, women are naturally more pacifist because they are mothers. And that is Florence Gurton Tuttle, who is this really interesting woman who very, very few people I think know about or have written about and she very much saw her own motherhood as key to her desire for world peace and world citizenship. She absolutely believed that women's maternal instincts were what qualified them to work for peace and to help shape the global polity. And she made the, the comparison directly between women educating their children in the home and helping their children grow and understand their responsibilities to their communities. She translated that maternal experience into women's qualifications to work for peace on the global stage. So she, Tuttle was one of the few, I think that I came across in this book who made that connection between motherhood and maternalism and peace very explicitly. It's interesting because it, it's just another um, sort of fault line in in the movement, the peace movement, but also the international, you know, the movement for international global government. Um, and, and of course, we know that the United States doesn't join the League of Nations in 19 uh, in the 1920s, but uh, it was still a great period for the peace movement. I mean, there's the Kellogg-Briand Pact that outlaws war, the Washington Naval Conference, which sees the size of navies around the world decreased. And the United States kind of kind of sort of joins the world court or at least recognizes it. But I was, you know, your book moves into this period, into the 1920s, after the League is established but not joined by the U.S. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what role that women played in the 1920s. So I think one of the things that's really interesting about the 20s is how many different roles women play. Because the, the context for this is the breakup of the suffrage movement. So the 19th Amendment is ratified in 1920. And at that point, this sort of huge juggernaut of a suffrage movement fractures. And so you get the formation of the League of Nations, or sorry, of the League of Women Voters, obviously out of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And the League takes on a lot of this interest in international relations and in peace. This was actually something I wrote about a lot in my first book. And then there are other women who become much more radical pacifists in the 1920s, particularly after the formation of the Women's Peace Party and then the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in 1919. WILF continues to be an important organization in the 20s, but you also have more radical peace activists in the Women's Peace Society and the Women's Peace Union. And then there are sort of the more mainstream internationalist women who like, like Tuttle and like Carrie Chapman Catt, for example, who Catt is involved in the League of Women Voters. And then in 1925, 
she brings together a lot of the international committees of the major women's organization into the National Committee on the Cause and Cure of War. And that kind, I think, I think Kat's brand of internationalism dominates a lot of U.S. women's international thinking in the 1920s. And it's very middle of the road. It's very, yes, we should join the League of Nations and the World Court, but only because those are limited <laughs> bodies with safeguards for national sovereignty. And it's a lot about education. We need to educate Americans on the importance of peace, on the importance of the World Court, on the importance of the Kellogg-Briand Pact. So one of the reasons I think that, that that women's internationalism in the 20s is so widespread is because it's diffuse and it's relatively tame. Fascinating. That's good. Yeah. Oh, and then by 1931, things start to look a lot different. I mean, obviously, you know, depression, end of exuberance, Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Right. Um, so your fourth chapter takes on two women, uh, Rosika Schwimmer, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Lola Maverick Lloyd. And, and their ideas about a post-League of Nations global system is fascinating. Um, can you tell us what it is and, and how they came to that perspective? <laughs> yes, Schwimmer and Lloyd are, I just find them fascinating. They, along with their protege, Edith Winner, who gets her own chapter later in the book, are by far the most radical of the women that I look at here. They were, Schwimmer and Lloyd were both absolute pacifists. So whereas somebody like Esther Brunauer, for example, believed that the United States had to fight in order to ensure long-term peace, Schwimmer and Lloyd completely rejected that. They, they rejected war and violence under any circumstances. But they were also by far the most radical in, in other ways too, in terms of their feminism in terms of their their <laughs> their more extensive belief in equality i wouldn't go so far as to say that they saw everyone in the world <laughs> as equal but i think they did i think their their vision of equality was deeper than other women in the book particularly somebody like andrews and they were also radical because they didn't trust government they didn't trust the United States government. They didn't trust world governments. And so what they really believed was going to have to happen in order to secure a world government was for the people of the world, not just to demand one, but to actually get themselves together and build one. Schwimmer and Lloyd did not think that governments could be relied on to form any kind of world governing body. And so their vision was really a populist vision of of implementing a world government through the actions of ordinary people. So what do you think inspired that though? Because I I love that there's this spectrum of ideas, but what do you think the motivation motivation for Schwimmer say is or 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 for Lloyd? I mean, is it where does that come from? Is it their background, their upbringing, or is it education? I think it's their background and upbringing. Um neither one of them had a lot of formal education. But, you know, Rosa, Rosa Geschwimmer was a Hungarian Jewish woman who was exiled from Hungary in 1920 and came to the United States in 1921. She had met Lola Maverick Lloyd earlier on in, um, in her career while she was touring the United States in 1914. And so when she came in 1921, she stayed with Lloyd in Chicago. And the, really the key... I think probably more than anything else, the key thing that pushed both Schwimmer and Lloyd toward this radical vision of world government was Schwimmer's battle for U.S. citizenship. So Schwimmer in, the, in 1926 applies to become a U.S. citizen, and she fills out the petition, and on the petition it asks are you willing to bear arms in defense of the United, Nation, in, in defense of the United States? And she says no. And there's a very, there's a much longer story behind this, but eventually in 1929, the U.S. Supreme Court denies her U.S. citizenship because she says she will not bear arms in defense of the nation. She's 50 years old. She's a woman. She's a pacifist. But none of that 
the fact that she's a 50 year old woman and would not have been allowed to bear arms even if she had wanted to did not matter. She's a pacifist, she's seen as a threat, therefore she is denied US citizenship and she remains stateless for the next 19 years until she dies in 1948. And Lola Maverick Lloyd is by her side throughout the whole legal process um, Lloyd really, she, she supports Schwimmer financially. She supports her emotionally. So she's, Lloyd is very invested in Schwimmer's battle for citizenship. And I think that when Schwimmer is denied U.S. citizenship and is rendered stateless, which had very serious practical implications, she couldn't really work. She didn't have, she didn't have security in the United States. She could have been kicked out of the country at any point. I think that has a deep impact on both women. They had already been formulating this idea of a world government. The earliest record that I found of their putting this idea to paper was 1924. But I think that Schwimmer's citizenship case really solidified their, their understanding of the need both for a world government, but particularly for world citizenship as a legal status. Schwimmer and Lloyd were the only women in this book who argued that for example, all people in the world needed what they called a world passport. They wanted legal protections against statelessness that would help people not only like Schwimmer, but would also help the millions of refugees around the world in the 1930s. Yeah, and that's where the distrust comes from, I guess, as well. I mean, it's it's that that's so uh, that's such a big part of I think us, but all of these views about collective security too, in terms of motives. Um, they they seem as different as the uh, as the intellectual sort of ideas that come out of those motives. And one of the things that seems particularly different amongst almost all of the nine is the, this question about enforcing the peace. Um, and how how big of a problem is that for recon reconciling the movement, the peace movement, and 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 how much does enforcement feature in the debates about gender equality too? So the question of enforcement is interesting because it's a problem and it's not. It's not a problem because a lot of these women did not have a concrete plan for what a world government should look like. And so they never got as far as thinking about, oh, how are we gonna enforce this? But for some of them, it was an issue. For Lucia Ames Mead, for example, she thought that sanctions were economic sanctions, were a way that a world body could enforce its, its, its determination um, or its decisions about conflict resolution or something like that. But for Schwimmer and Lloyd, they were very, part of the core of their plan was that it was non-military. They did not want a world army. They did not want any, they actually didn't want any kind of national military. They made some vague provisions for national police forces, but they did not want any kind of international enforcement mechanism like a military or a police. And of course they took a lot of criticism for that, although they took criticisms for all parts of their plan. But, but that was something that they felt very strongly about. And there were others, who, who I talk about in the book, who, who sort of vaguely recognized that some kind of enforcement mechanism might be necessary, particularly to keep nations in line, but it was not something that a lot of them engaged on any kind of particularly deep level. And, and do you think that th their views on enforcement had a direct correlation to their their views on equality broadly, but then also equality for women in the global space? That's a really good question. I'm not sure. And I would imagine that if some of them had carried the idea for, of enforcement a little bit further, I'm thinking of Schwimmer in particular, who, you know, who had been the subject of anti-communist persecution and who I think did feel personally vulnerable because of her ideas. I think that she would have been much more reluctant to endorse any kind of military because she recognized that it would have affected women differently. Um, but I'm, I'm actually not sure that a lot of them thought about it to that extent. You know, I don't think that 
particularly the white women, I don't think would have seen themselves as vulnerable because they weren't stateless, they were American citizens. And so I think that helped them feel protected from potential state violence in a way that of course, a lot of other women didn't. Yeah, well, seeing as you've mentioned um, the white women, I think it's a good opportunity to bring up the only person of color in the book featured is Mary McLeod Bethune. And I was wondering if you could say about how she shaped the post-World War II global order. Yes. Mary McLeod Bethune is fantastic. And of course, she's one of the people in this book that other scholars have done great work on, although I would argue there's still a lot more to be done on her. She just had such a long and varied career. The thing that I was really interested in is her, her involvement in the early formation of the United Nations, particularly through her leadership of the National Council of Negro Women. She was one of these well-known Black activists who in the 1940s was really thinking about how Black Americans could participate in, in the war effort, but also in reshaping the world in the wake of World War II. So the National Council of Negro Women was, they, were re they really started a lot of planning efforts among organized women. Bethune was involved, for example, in a couple of different um, efforts that were centered in Washington, D.C., of women in a lot of these non-governmental organizations who were coming together to try to strategize about how they could be involved in post-war planning and eventually in the formation of the United Nations. And so Bethune gets herself invited to the San Francisco conference in the spring of 1945, where the UN is really founded. And of course, from my perspective, the most interesting thing that she brings to the table is this deep understanding of racial inequality and of the racial dimensions of citizenship. So not only is she a woman, not only does she understand gendered components of citizenship, but she looks at suffrage and she looks at, at women's activism from a completely different perspective because she's so deeply rooted in this tradition of, Af of African-American women's activism. So I think for her, the, the arguments that she's making on behalf of the United Nations, not just in San Francisco, but before that as well, I think really bring a different dimension to the conception of what it means for women to be world citizens. I mean, it's an incredible arc if you take it from, you know, where you start in the 18, 1880s, 1890s, uh, you know, where the birth of some of these people to 1945 in San Francisco. And, and then years later, when, you know, women like Eleanor Roosevelt will be um, putting together the the human rights uh, convention. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible arc of a story. I wanted to give some air to some of the, the the women that are dissenters actually, and on the other side, because a, a few years ago, I found these recordings of Alice Roosevelt Longworth from 1945 and 1955. I mean, she was uh, prominent in the, so prominent in Washington that her nickname was the other Washington monument. And uh, in, in her recordings in 45 and, uh, sorry, 54 and 55, I went back to them and and she scoffs at the idea of a world government as something that's unworkable. And, and in fact, contra contrary to the interests of the United States. And I think one Democrat in, in the 1920s called her the colonel of the battalion of death for her, uh, her role in stopping or torpedoing the League of Nations. I was wondering if you could, if you could say anything that you came across in your own research or, you know, or, or even just reading later on, how prominent are anti-globalists among female activists? Very prominent particularly among anti-communist female activists. So the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Women Patriots, the, you know, the, the whole long list of conservative women's groups who are persecuting Rosica Schwimmer in the 1920s. And they are behind the proliferation of the spider web chart in 1923 and 1924. And you know, and then into the 1930s, um, you know, they are, they're very against the left, they're against the Communist Party. Um, 
And of course, at the end of World War II, they, you know, there's a, there's a couple of years before the Cold War really calcifies that these conservative women, some of them think, oh, okay, United Nations, okay, maybe, maybe this could work. Okay, you know, as, as long as there are limits in place, and for them in particular, that means a veto on the Security Council, then they, then these conservative right-leaning women are, are more inclined to get on board the United Nations. But then, of course, very quickly, as soon as McCarthyism and the Second Red Scare become much more widespread, they are right back to their anti-globalist, anti-communist. They're very suspicious of the world government movement as a whole. And then actually in the, in the conclusion of the book, I talk about these House and Senate hearings in 1949 and 1950 on a resolution um, that's basically the closest the United States ever gets to considering any kind of world government. And it's the anti-communist women who show up at these hearings to denounce it and to talk about what a bad idea it is. So yes, they are definitely there really throughout the whole period of this book. And I, there was one other thing I was thinking about too on this, this point of um, sort of anti-communist 1950s McCarthyism is there a class dynamic? I mean, I know there is at the outset in the 1910s when you talk about um, Meade, but does that change over time? Is it is it wealthier women that fly the flag for peace and global government for the duration of this period, or does that change? Does it become women of a different class or lo lower, you know, even you know, impoverished women? That's a really interesting question that I'm not sure I have fully thought about. But just thinking about the women in this book. As far as the ones who are born in the United States, with the exception perhaps of Mary McLeod Bethune, who's, who's born into poverty in the 1870s, but then becomes much more middle-class by the middle of the 20th century. Apart from her, the ones who are born in the United States really are middle to upper middle class. So Tuttle is born into a very privileged family. Um, Lola Maverick Lloyd is born into a privileged family, the Mavericks, who come from Texas, but then she marries the son of Henry Demarest Lloyd. So she marries into all this Chicago Tribune money. The two for whom, the two who were not born in the United States were Schwimmer and Winner, both of whom were born in, in what is now Hungary. And they certainly were much more economically precarious, but they were also much better educated. Um, Winner in particular, you know, spoke several languages and was a self-made scholar. And so I think had she also had the financial support of the Lloyd family for most of her life. So they certainly had access to those middle-class resources. So I really, I don't think that even by the period of the late 1940s, these, these are not working class women, certainly, who are involved in the world government movement. I mean, it takes a lot of resources. They're traveling, they are, they're publishing, they're trying to distribute pamphlets and literature, and they're even, even just the cost in postage <laughs> to communicate with people in Europe and around the United States took considerable resources. So I'm not sure that the class dynamic changes very much. Yeah, I mean, that was my suspicion, but I just thought I'd give, I, I'd give you a chance to, to, to confirm that. Um, yeah. I suppose just as a matter of closing, I, I was wondering if you could just summarize overall the impact of female activism on global government, global citizenship, international law and relations, there, and not just these nine, but more broadly, perhaps outside of these nine, what can we say about the impact that, that women activists have had in this space? That's a really good question. I could probably say a lot of things. But I think the first thing that comes to mind is, goes back to something I said earlier, which is that I think it's really important to look at the challenges that these women represent. So I, I said this at the end of my first book, and I sort of felt it in writing this one too. When writing about women's international activism for peace in the first half of the 20th century, I usually find myself writing about failure. And 
But I think that failure is instructive. I think that there's a lot that we can learn from failure. I think that there are things we can learn from the questions they were asking, from the arguments that they were making, that highlight the critiques of the international system as it existed, that point out that it did not represent all people equally around the world, that not all people were able to participate in in the government itself, whether that was the League or the UN or any other kind of international body. I think that women represent an important challenge to the status quo. And that also includes their arguments for peace, their arguments for arbitration, their arguments for alternative methods of settling disputes among nations. Looking at the arguments that women are making for how international affairs should be conducted, for who should be involved in decision making, I think really highlights the the limitations of the mechanisms that did exist. And I think it also reminds us that it didn't have to be that way. That, you know, the, the course of world affairs in the first half of the 20th century did not have to turn out the way that it did. And looking at some of the alternatives that these women posed, I think, reminds us of that. Well, that is a brilliant place to think, leave things and encourage everyone to pick up your book, which is an outstanding read. Um, and I think, you know, if if you if you like the ideas that are here, that's part of it, too. But the biographies of some of these women are incredibly rich and it's a, it's a really rewarding read. So thank you so much for joining me, Megan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Michael. I've had so much fun talking about it with you. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.